Praise the Lord. Thank you. Praise the Lord. All right. Um, if you notice, I'm hesitating here. Because, see, this is the sermon that I wanted to preach right here. Boy, this is so good. But it ain't for you, so it ain't no use to preach the things, for God's sake. It ain't for you. The Lord began to change my mind. I said, don't do this. I don't have notes. He said, well, then you'll know how to preach. So, and I've done this before, but the Lord just told me to do this. So I'm going to just kind of preach out of my spirit. You may have heard me say some of these things. I have learned that anything I ask for, not some things. My theme this year is your everything is his anything. And that's St. John chapter 14, verses 12, 13, and 14. He says, whatsoever you shall ask in my name, that will I do. Why? That the Father may be glorified in the Son. Whatsoever you shall ask in my name. See, the church world has stopped us from asking God because they thought we might get greedy. Now, this is not my sermon. This is just a, this is an appetizer, just a, you know, a preamble. So how many of you want a new house? Okay. Now, some pe people could think that's greedy. No. Okay, put your hand up. How many of you want a new car? Watch this. Put your hand up. You know, if you don't ask God for that, you don't glorify him. Because, see, it's a whatsoever. That's St. John chapter 14, verses 13. Whatsoever you shall ask in my name. Now, you got to understand that power of eternity to use that name. That will I do. Why? That the Father may be glorified in the Son. And then he said, if you shall ask anything. Now, what does anything mean to you? Anything. Now, see, the church world would say, well, that's spiritual. No, it is in one sense. It's spiritual, it's physical, it's financial. But see, they're so worried about you becoming greedy, they have. They want to control to make sure. They don't really care sometimes if you come to church as long as you send your tithe. I've heard preachers say that. Now, my God, we don't care if you're going on vacation, but make sure your tithes are here. That's kind of a slap in the face, isn't it? This is not my sermon, but I want you to understand what I'm saying here. So I'm very comfortable in asking God for anything or everything. Because, see, my everything is his anything. When you understand that I'm his child. My name is Jesse Duplantis Christ. You see, I'm in the family. Now, go with me to 2 Corinthians chapter 9, and we're going to start reading verse 6. We can put, put it up on the, on the screen, and I want the old King James for it. Paul writing to the church at Corinth, he says, but this I say, he was so sparingly, shall reap also sparingly. And he was so bountifully, shall reap also bountifully. Now, what part of that you don't understand? What part of that you didn't get? Don't look at me, look at the verse. There is no faith in that verse. None. All that verse is, is action and reaction. This is what the Lord told me to speak about. Now, you may have heard me say some of this, but I'll, I'll say some newer things. Paul said, if you sow sparingly, you reap sparingly. If you sow bountifully, you reap bountifully. Action and reaction. Next verse. He says, every man or every person, according as he purposed in his heart. Notice, not in his head. So you don't need a heart bypass, you need a head bypass. <laughs> every man according as he purposed in his heart. Watch this. So let him give. Now, I want to ask you a question. How many times you went to a meeting and you gave an offering? I want an honest answer by a lifting of a hand. You went to a meeting and you gave an offering, and when you got home, you thought, I shouldn't have done that. <laughs> Hold your hand up. Why did you do that? Why did you come to a realization maybe you shouldn't have done that? Because you see, you didn't purpose in your heart. That's done before you get to church. That's not done while you're at church. So that an emotional financial pull will never move you to do something God don't want you to do. I want you to listen to me. Every man according as he purposed in his heart. So purpose affords you anchorage in the times of battle. When you're a person of purpose, you have foundation on your feet. Now, let me read the verse, and I'm going to talk about this. Stay on verse 8 right there. Uh, I believe, uh, verse 7, excuse me. Every man according as, uh, verse, uh, verse, every man according as he purposed in his heart, so let him give. Watch this. Not grudgingly. Now, look at this next three words. Or necessity. Uh-oh. Now, that's just jacked up the whole way of understanding how to give. Because God said you shouldn't give to need. No, don't, look, don't, don't look at me. Look at that. Look at that. Every man according as he purposed in his heart, so let him give, not grudging of necessity. 
Why are you giving to a need? Why, why, why would you do such a foolish thing when he told you not to do that? That's a waste of such spiritual energy. Y'all look at me like I done lost my mind. <laughs> why? Because the Bible said he'll supply how many need? Oh. How many need? Oh. How many need? Oh. Oh, oh, let me get black with it. How many need, Lord? <laughs> hey, Lord Jesus. <laughs> so you've heard me say this thousands of times. I don't tell God what I need. I tell him what I want. So then when you do that, you're not giving grudgingly, nor of necessity, for God loveth not like it, but he loveth a cheerful giver. Now, every man according as he purpose in his heart. When you're a person of purpose, it produces prayer in your life. That's right. So prayer and purpose gets together and produces a baby named perception. So you can read that verse. Don't put the, keep the verse up there. Every man according as he purpose in his heart, purpose, prayed and perceived. Now, when purpose, prayer, and perception gets together, it produces another baby called power. So you could read that verse, every man according as he purposed, prayed, perceived, and powered. Now, everybody likes that power, but the problem is power can be very dangerous because you must be superior to it instead of driven by it. See, that's why politicians mess up and preachers mess up. They are driven by power instead of being superior to power. You've heard me say that. Let me say it again. Jesus was a man of great power. And, what, and they're all trying to kill him. I said this the other day, I, I got to repeat it. They tried to push him off a cliff. Jesus had enough of that. He just turned around and I'm going to paraphrase. You want to dance with me? You want some of this? Then he said, I can call more than 12 legions of angels to handle this situation. Now, let, and I said, I got to say it again. One angel in the Bible knocked down 185,000 men. So if 12 legions of angels would have showed up at the beck and call of Jesus, which he had, 20 billion, 400 million men would have bit the dust in one lick. One lick. The world has not known that kind of population. But because Jesus was superior to that power, instead of driven by that power, he went to the cross so you didn't have to go. <laughs> Got it? So you could read that verse, every man according as he purposed, prayed, perceived, and powered. So let him give, not grudging on necessity. But wait, what about if my church needs, I, I need to present something to my church? Right. Well, isn't that a need? Y yes, in a sense. But you see, you're not giving to the need. You're giving to the purpose of what the need will do once it is met. So I don't tell God what I need. I tell him what I want. So when you get up and say, we're believing God, to whatever, you, whatever you believe for your ministry, instead of a need, you say, and you're not giving to the need because the need gets old, but the purpose never does. You're giving to the purpose. I'm not spending this. Listen to me. You're giving to the purpose of what that'll do once it is met. So in other words, if you've done this before you get to church and your pastor gets up and says, we need to build a new building, instead of giving to a need, you go, oh, yes, now I know why that was so strong on me. Because you're not giving to the need, you're giving to the purpose of what that will do once it's done. Are y'all getting this? I want you to notice how many times God says all, always, in all these verses. Go to the next verse now. And I love the next verse. I call this the black verse of the Bible. But it, this is black. And God is able. Hmm. I said, the Lord. Oh, oh. I said, the Lord is able. Oh, you ain't hearing me. Believe I walk over here a while. I said, the Lord, 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 Lord is able. Look at the white people. Look at the black people. Going down with your bad self, devil. Go ahead, white boy. I said, and God is able to make how much grace? All. How much grace? All. How much grace? All. God is able to make all grace abound toward who? Me. Toward who? Me. That you what? Always. That you what? Always. Notice that how many times it says all abound to you, always having what? All. Having all what? Yes. In all what? Why are you mad at me because I have a jet? Let me get to that camera. Why are you mad at me because I have a jet? No. All I'm doing is being biblical. Amen. What's your problem? Amen. I'm not being rude here. All sufficiency in all things. If things are so bad, why is God giving you all sufficiency to get it? Maybe you ladies want a real Louis Vuitton purse or Chanel, or Escada, or Givenchy, or Christian Dior. I'm talking about a real Louis Vuitton. I ain't talking about one of them knockoffs that when the cops come, they run around the corner. 
I'm talking real Louis Vuitton. You want to see two new ones, two, two real ones, they're sitting right there on the floor. Nothing wrong with that. Well, my God, I, 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 they shouldn't have that. They could use a flower sack. <laughs> That's true. But who wants a flower sack? <laughs> Notice I said, who wants it? Come on. I ain't saying anything about the need of it. Right. Come on. See, God is able to make all grace abound toward you that you're always having all sufficiency in all things. Now, can you understand why in 41 years of full-time ministry, I've never had a financial deficit? You think it was because of my faith? Mm -mm. It was because of that. Ver Don't look at me. Look at the verse. <laughs> all sufficiency in all things. Then the other part of that verse kicks in, may abound to every good work. If you're a pastor, let me help you. There's a rumor going around the United States and other countries. Say, so you better watch that Kenneth Copeland and that Jerry Savelle and that Jesse DePlanis and that Keith Moore and that Bill Winston and that Creflo A. Dollar Jr. Because boy, they come to town, they'll suck all the money out of the church. They'll suck all the money out of that thing. And you, it'll hurt your church. Now, either you lying or God's lying, I pick you. <laughs> Why? Abound to every good work. Pastors, is your work good? Yes, sir. Sure it is. So you don't have to worry about us. Well, I lost a few of you right there. See, why? Because God is El Shaddai, not El Chipo. Like as if you're going to exhaust God's blessing. On your best day, you cannot impress him with your wealth. He's got gold streets. You got asphalt <laughs> with holes in them this big sometimes. <laughs> All sufficient don't think. So why? Oh, now I'm, I'm, I'm going to make somebody real mad. So, oh, should I say it? He said, say it. He said, so why, why should I have to suffer? Well, you know, the first church, yeah, I know the first church. The first church was the foundation church. The most powerful weight on, of this building is on the foundation. But you're not the foundation of the church. You're the roof. Now, listen to me. That doesn't mean we don't go through things. We understand, but we go through them. We don't stop and canonize the place while we're going through. Though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death. Then say, though I stop, build a house and canonize the place. You see. See, I've learned some things. If you'll listen to ministers and they'll tell you what not to do, don't do it. If, if, if they tell you, listen, there's a big old sinkhole when you walk out of this convention center, don't drive your, and you go drive your car in that? That's foolishness. You see, so they taught us what not to do as well as taught us what to do. And I'm talking about this. We would not have the Arab-Israeli problem if Abraham wouldn't have done what he did. But, you know, it was tantalizing if you think about it. They, all the theologians say, no, he didn't really want to do it. Yo, mama. <laughs> I mean, think about it for a minute. Let's just get right down to the flesh. Abraham, I can't have a baby. So I want you to go into my, into my servant's um, tent and I want you to have intercourse with her to have a baby. Abraham says, I'm going to do this for you, Sarah. <laughs> Any woman in the world would believe that you done lost your ever-loving mind. He said, what's up, Hagar? And then when it all started going south, he didn't know what to do. You see, that was a mistake there. And God kept telling him, through Sarah will all the nations of the world be blessed. Yeah, but I, 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 I'm getting old. Sarah's getting old. Have you seen her lately, Lord? Both her arms, when she prays you, the bottom of them do this. <laughs> Don't get mad at me now, Lord. I saw somebody went, <laughs> just keep your arms down and praise God like this. That's all I can tell you. I don't know. I don't know why women worry about their arms anyway. Let me help you, lady. One time I hugged a woman. She said, oh, my God, I hope you didn't feel my back fat. I said, what did you say? I hope you didn't feel my back fat. Ladies, let me help you here. There ain't no man in the world saying, did you see that woman's back fat? <laughs> he ain't looking at your back fat. He looking at other parts. 
He could care less about your back fat. And if he does look at your back, it's a lot lower. I'm getting out of town this afternoon. I'm laying it on you. I'm I'm <laughs> Looking carefully. You see what I'm saying? So God, I say, okay, let me go on. And God is able to, to make all grace abound towards it that you always having all sufficiency at all things that may abound to every good work. It is written, he has dispersed abroad. He hath given to the poor. Now watch this, his righteousness remaineth forever. We had a little conversation in the back, me and Creflo. I said, Creflo, you're trying to explain that grace message. I said, let me give it to you in one sentence. He said, what's that, Jesse? Quit trying to become what you already are. That's the grace message. He went, my God, that's it. See, you, you don't earn this through the Mosaic law, you know, blah, blah, blah. Just quit trying to become what you already are. You are what God says you are. You see what I'm saying? Yeah, but I don't feel it. That don't make no difference. You are what God says you are. Sometimes you don't feel saved, but you saved. Sometimes you do unsaved things, but you're still saved. You ask God, you repent of it, say, Lord, forgive me. I didn't mean to blow it like that. But you, you, I, you know, and the old Pentecostal people said, if you just slipped up once and you died, you went to hell. God's mercy and grace is far stronger than that. See, they're judging you, see. As it is written, he has dispersed abroad. So I have the ability to disperse abroad. He has given to the poor. So I should do that. My righteousness remained forever. So the reason why I didn't get angry and want to kill somebody when they attacked me was because my righteousness remaineth forever. I didn't say I didn't feel like doing something like that, but my righteousness got ahead of my anger. You see, he is dispersed abroad. He has given to the poor. His righteousness remained forever. Now, next verse, he was ministered seed to the sower, not to the keeper. I love to give more than anything in my life. I enjoy that more than anything. And I don't have to know you to do it. Now, when you say things like that, people write me, oh, but just, would you pay off my house? No. But if God told me to, I would. I ain't going to hell over your house. If he told me to. I mean, trust God enough to talk to me. When you ain't listening, how you know I ain't listening? You see what I'm saying? Now, he that's ministers seeds of the sower, not the keeper, he says, watch this, both minister bread for your food. Notice how many times this, this is getting bigger and bigger by the moment. Both minister bread for your food and multiply your seed sown. How can your seed be sown? How can it multiply? Because you see, I quit giving seeds a long time ago and I, I'm in a new stage of giving harvests. I like giving harvests. And then I asked the Lord, well, what are, and you heard me say, what do you get when you give a harvest? Well, you know, when you sow a harvest, you get an orchard. <laughs> I'm not talking about one tree. I'm talking about the whole shebang. You see, now he was made seed to the soil, ministered bread for your food, multiplies your seed. So, and here we go with the increase again and increase the fruits of your righteousness. See, God looked down and saw two boys, one named Jerry Savelle and the other Jesse the Planters in a nightclub. Jerry's at the bar and I'm, at, I'm on the stage. Let me tell you, if you don't think God got a sense of humor, me and Kenneth Copeland played the same nightclub in Fort Worth. <laughs> now, we didn't know each other. Brother Copeland sang and played at the town pump in Fort Worth. Anybody ever go to the town pump? <laughs> None of y'all that old? <laughs> and I played the town pump. Oh, yeah, because that was the number one club in Fort Worth many, many, many years ago. In fact, one was opened in Dallas in the 1970s called the Village Pump to try to get the same thing going on at the town pump in Fort Worth. Isn't that amazing? Never think we'd ever preach together, much less be preachers. But see, God knows the beginning from the end. And I'm pretty sure most people never thought that God could never use a Kenneth Copeland when he was singing Pledge of Love. <laughs> or Jesse the Planters when I was playing all this stuff and I mean, I'm talking with the makeup and the, all the craziness and wow, and the, you know, and that hair just a slinging like that and people screaming and hollering. Yet God saw something. What did he see? Watch this, righteousness. Was I doing any righteousness? No, but see, God was calling those things that be not as though they were before I ever knew who he was. 
He was setting my future up even before I even knew I had a future. Do you see that? Let me say that again. Now, he that ministers seed to the soul and ministers bread for your food, multiplies your seed, so on, increases the fruits of your righteousness. Next verse, being enriched, not just rich, being enriched in how many things? Everything. Now, what does everything mean to you? Everything. Being enriched in everything to what? There's that word all again, all bountifully. Why do people get mad at me? Because I'm blessed in the city, blessed in the field, blessed going in, blessed going out. That doesn't mean I don't need partners in my ministry, but I'm just blessed. But I'm going to say something going to be so radical. This is so radical, it's going to blow your socks off. I'm believing God one day that I'll be the partner to you instead of you the partner to me. Let me tell you something. If that guy from Amazon can make that much money, just to the plant his skin too. I just got to have an idea, a concept, and an understanding how to do that. Sam Walton of Walmart. What a great idea he had. You know what his idea was? Stand outside the store and say, thank you for shopping Walmart. Give them a good product at a good price and be nice about it. That was his idea. And an idea is the most phenomenal thing anybody can use in this life. It is the most richest thing. It can produce things beyond your wildest dreams. An idea. Being enriched in all bountifulness, which causes it through us thanksgiving to God. So if you notice, I never make an excuse for the blessing of God in my life. So when I'm being, um, you know, slammed by the media, me and Brother Copeland together. It's kind of nice that me and Kenneth are getting hit together if two of us agree. <laughs> I mean, they nail him, then they nail me, and, and you know, this and that and all. They show us, I don't know where to get the pictures going out to the airport to get on the plane and all this kind of stuff. What they don't know, and let me help you people. You helping me. <laughs> One day I may buy your station, then you are going to work for me. <laughs> I hope I like you. That's impossible. Somebody got to own that station. See, somebody got to own that business. Why does it always have to be somebody else and not you? Because most people tell you, including the church, that you can't do that because you might get greedy. That ain't greed, ladies and gentlemen. It could be growth. When's the last time a poor man helped you? The best thing to do, best thing for the poor is not to be poor so you can be a blessing to the poor. But you don't look down on people. Your money don't make you who you are. Your ideas does. What will you accomplish? What will people remember by you if you should die and go by the way of the grave? What legacy will you leave? If you believe what I just said, you, everyone in this building will leave a legacy beyond your wildest dreams. I'm talking about spiritual, physical, and financial. You, should, you do have the ability to make enough money to handle all three different generations. You, your children, and your children's children. Do you know how much money that is? Do you know that Isaac never spent a dime of his money? Yeah, ain't that something? He only was spending Abraham's. That's how much Abraham, he was how rich? Very rich. Now, if he, is the, if he is our father of faith, why did God make him rich? Watch this. So you could have an inheritance. So you could have an inheritance. So watch that. Isaac didn't spend a dime of his money. He already had Abraham's. My God, Esau and Jacob didn't spend any of their money. They could, they, when they finally got their act together, my God, man, the anointing was on both of them, even though one didn't regard God very much, yet he was, God blessed him. Why? Isaac's money. I tell people when I give them, you don't understand, not only is this a seed or a harvest I'm giving, but I'm putting in that harvest, my anointing is on that. You hang around with me, you're going to get debt free. You understand what I do, what I do will come upon you in every area. What you do with Kenneth Copeland Mission will come upon you. When you sow that seed, you'll be walking in Australia. You'll be walking in the Ukraine. Do you understand? No, you don't understand because you think you just gave an offering. You didn't give an offering. You gave a seed. 
and a seed is reproducing constantly. You can't stop it. There's one place in Amer in, on this planet Earth, and it's up around the Antarctica. It hadn't rained for three million years. They know that for a fact. So a man went down there and took a little glass. He put a seed. Oh, now, there was a seed already in the ground. He saw it. Been there three million years. So he covered it with a glass, put a candle inside of it, and watered it. Within three days, a green sprout grew up. You can even turn bad soil into good soil if you know what to put in it. You know, there's something happening now because of the fertilizer we use and the runoff, it's a cancer causing, gets all over in our rivers. But years ago, they used to use cow manure. I know anybody want to mess with no cow manure, but for some crazy reason or another, it sure made your flowers grow. It made the sweetest corn. It was called organic. <laughs> Do you understand what I'm trying to say? That's why your grandma and your grandpa could eat eggs fried and bacon grease because the pigs were organic. <laughs> the pigs were eating organic. Everything was organic. They had their own, um, uh, they, they grew their own vegetables and they grew their own chickens. I remember my grandfather, you know, and I, lived, I was raised up on the street with him. And he went, when we'd go to his house, he'd have chickens in his yard. So when we had fried chicken on Sunday, we didn't go to the store and buy a chicken. Somebody was going to die that day. <laughs> and he'd go out there and catch a chicken. And the chicken knew it. He was speaking in tongue. Blah, 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 blah. That's it. And, he, and we'd eat him. That's why they could live 70, 80, 90, and 100 years, eat eggs fried in bacon grease. Because even the grease was organic. Because it was all homegrown. Think about that. Kathy's mother, grandmother lived to 104, ate anything she wanted. And now we're the generation, we know how to exercise. Yeah, we got so many knee replacements hip replacements. You never saw all that stuff 40, 50 years ago. I believe in exercise. Don't misunderstand me. But I mean, you're not created a deer. You're not created a thoroughbred. You see, you should exercise, but you wasn't created to do some of the stuff that you put your body through. Then we had this thing, no pain, no gain. Boy, no, that's not right. Because the guy that said that has got two knee replacements. Think about that for a minute. Exercise is not a good thing for you to lose weight. You got to run almost an hour and a half just to get a pound off. That's 3,500 calories. But if you eat less, you knock that baby out real fast. But you should exercise. I believe it. I exercise all the time. I mean, I, I, I am very, very disciplined with my exercise. Oh, yeah, I do that because I, I'm not, I don't care how I look on the outside. I care about what's going on on the inside. Because you see, if something on the outside ain't working, that don't affect nothing. But if something quits on the inside, the outside gonna know about it real quick. <laughs> now he says all sufficiency in all things may abound to every good work. So I decided that I would abound to every good work. Now when I said that, people just, Sam, people, preacher said, I, I, that, that, I know Jesus said that, but. Well, no, you don't know Jesus said that. You don't know. You're trying to convince yourself that what he said is true. But when you know in whom you have believed, yeah. you've heard me say it before, people are trying to convince themselves, I'm believing, I'm believing, I'm believing, I'm believing, I'm believing. I'm believing, I'm believing, I'm standing on, I, 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 I think I'm, I, I don't know what I'm doing. I'm just trying to get this thing to work. And see, and, and, and we get into all these religious practices. Jesus didn't come to create Christianity. He didn't create Christianity. He stayed Jewish all the time he was here. Mankind created Christianity. Jesus would never do what Christianity has done. Jesus would never molest a child in church. Jesus would never kill people like the Crusades did. But ball religion will. What is religion? It's a garden of weeds. It's a theological wilderness. See, I've had people tell me all the time, uh, Dr. Duplantis, what do you believe in? I said, Jesus. Well, we all believe in that. I said, no, you don't. You attest to it, but you don't believe in it. See, we believe in healing if he does it, because, but we add a little incentive. 
if he does it. I don't know, I'll never forget not long ago, I read an article about, in a Christian magazine, when God does it, heal. I thought you got to be kidding me. God heals all the time. Sometimes they're not always received. You know, Jesus already died for every person ever born, every person that'd be born. No one, we sh hell shouldn't have one person in it at all. But you got to make a choice of which, what you're going to do with it. Do you choose to be healed or you hope to be healed? Even God said in Deuteronomy, he said, choose life. I put before you death and life. And he said, just choose life. See, I choose to be blessed. Not so I can live better. Because, you know, if you raise eating fried chicken, you, <laughs> you can get so rich. You can have a, a, a you can, you know, well, I'll just, I'll give you an example. I can eat anywhere I want in the city of New Orleans. God has blessed me beyond my wildest dream. So all these fine restaurants know me. All the other ones do too. Why? Because sometimes you just want a cheeseburger. I ain't saying you got to eat it every day. In fact, I was in Honolulu, Hawaii at Art and Kuna Sepulveda, a Word of Life Church. It's a great church. If, if you ever go, just, don't cut God out of your, of your vacation. Go to church. Go, just go there. Enjoy yourself. You know, enjoy yourself if you want to. But, so a Kuna calls and Art calls. He said, hey, but, but Jesse, we want to take you. What's the name of that restaurant? Mariposa? Mariposa. It's at the Neiman White. She said, you want to go? And I said, Kathy, tell her I don't want to go to Mariposa. And she said, why? I said, it's too healthy. It's just too healthy. I mean, I can eat grass like a cow if I want to. That's too healthy. I, I, I want something Hawaiian. I want something with some flavor. Now, I'm not talking about doing this all the time. You know what I'm saying? I, I, I don't eat. I mean, I like fried chicken. I don't eat it very much. But when I do, I enjoy it. I mean, when I eat a piece of it, I don't say, God, don't kill me. Don't cluck up my arteries. No. You know? But I believe in eating healthy and doing right. But what is healthy? Because everything you eat today, how many times they said you, get, you, you went to a certain place where there's nothing but they serve organic food and you found out that they were getting it anywhere they could and charged you higher for it? I've had people say, you know a little bit about organized crime. I said, let me tell you something about organized crime. You want organized crime? Washington, D.C. That's organized crime. <laughs> That's organized crime. But they just have the power not to go to jail. If you'd have done what Hillary Clinton done, you'd have went to jail. And I, I'm not against Hillary. I've never met her. I think she's a very smart woman. I do. I think she's a, but she's a brilliant lawyer. I'm not, but if you'd have done that, you'd have went to jail. If you'd have done what Bill did, you definitely would have went to jail. <laughs> that doesn't mean he's not smart. That doesn't mean he's not a good politician. I'm not saying that. I'm just saying, well, you know, that's my person in private life. No, not when you're president. When you're president, you're president 24 hours a day. You want that job, that's 24 seven. And if you're a preacher, that's 24 seven. That's 24 seven. You shouldn't be messing up with the piano player. You shouldn't be messing up. No, no preacher ought to be accused of adultery. What are you doing? You are a minister of the gospel 24-7. God's given you all sufficiency in all things. You should abound to every good way. Well, my wife ain't as pretty as she used to be. Well, neither you. <laughs> ain't nobody as pretty as they used to be. Young's wonderful, but it don't last long. My granddaughter grabbed this the other day. Grandfather, what's this? I said, a safe deposit box <laughs> that I keep your future in. <laughs> now she sees that I'm a blessed man. She knows that. Finally, she came up to her, she said, Grandfather, how much money you got? And where is it? I want to <laughs> see it. <laughs> She's 11. I said, why are you asking me that, Meredith? She said, you, everything, you said everything you have belongs to mama and me. <laughs> I said, that's right. Everything me and Mimi has belongs to your mother and you. You my only ass. Well, where is it? I said, it's here. But I can't show you that the day, I, there will come a time I will. I said, let me tell you something, little Meredith. You're 11 years old. You'll never have to work a day in your life. 
I said, but you're going to work. We're going to teach you to work. Do you understand? And just because I've left you, I've got you an inheritance, that doesn't mean you're better than anybody. You never look down on someone. Nothing. You don't do that. And I said, when you go in somebody's home, I don't care if it's small, big, whatever. You, if they love it, you love it. There's not, as long as you're out the rain, you know, you're, you know I, I said, you're going to work. We a generation that works. We believe in that. Now, there's some people, they don't, don't want to work. Well, you're going to, somebody's got to do something. If, if they took all the money of every rich person in America, we'd only touch maybe, what, 3%? Of all, of, we got a $22 trillion deficit. And they always say it's unfair to pay our fair share. Whoa, whoa, whoa. everybody, excuse me. If you pay people to be poor, they're going to stay poor. That was Ronald Reagan's statement. Now, I know Jerry Savelle likes Ronald Reagan. And, you know, I'm kind of, I think it's fun. I like Ronald Reagan. I went and visited the, uh, the White House. So I went to the White House, little bookstore, and I bought me a, 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 an original Washington, D.C. White House photo of Ronald Reagan. And I wrote on it, Dear Jesse. <laughs> I wrote on it, Dear Jesse, I can't thank you enough for praying for me and for helping me to win this election. This is in the 80s. Without your prayer for and, and financial support, I would not have become president. I can't thank you enough. Sign Ronald Reagan. I put it in my boardroom. Kathy's mother came over. And she, walked, she went, and she liked Ronald Reagan. She said, my God, Jesse, you know Ronald Reagan? I said, look at the picture. She read it. She goes, wow, I didn't know you knew. He said that. I said, no, I bought it myself and wrote it myself. I thought it was funny. She didn't think it was funny at all. But I thought it was funny. Hey, it's my story. I'm going to write it the way I want to write it. You see what I'm saying? So I had preachers tell me when I first went into the ministry, now when you go out and eat dinner, just leave your wallet and let somebody pay for it. I said, that's not going to happen. Do you know, and I know a lot of waiters and waitresses because Kathy don't cook, so we eat out twice a day. That, that's just the way it is. And she can cook good, but she's delivered from the bondage. She's not going back to Egypt. <laughs> she ain't going back to that. The only time she cooks, if there's a hurricane, she cooks. <laughs> and you know what they tell me? That the worst tippers are preachers. All of them say it. I'm not known for that. I give them, they go, are you, are you serious? I just went to, uh, was it a couple of days ago, me and Keith and Kathy went to, what's it called, Rietta's? Is that right? There's a nice restaurant here in downtown Fort Worth. I really like, they got the biggest onion rings. My God, you could throw them, play horseshoes with them. <laughs> they good. I mean, they, I mean, things are big, man. They, I, I, have you ever eaten them? They, they're big, good, you know? So I, um, I said, Keith, this is my meal. And Keith goes, <laughs> I like the way Keith laughed. He said, I left my wallet. I said, I said he said, that's convenient, isn't it? I said, I said yeah, we, we're just laughing, talking, talking about that kind of stuff. And uh, so anyway, I paid for the meal. So when the guy came, I said, you like your tip? He goes, oh, you, you got to be kidding me. Are you serious? I said, you got to make a living, don't you? I don't know the man. I don't have to know the man to be generous. Why? Well, how can you be generous? All sufficiency in all things. He said, are you serious? I wanted to tell him, you want me to take it back? <laughs> I was at a P.F. Chang's one time, not, long, not too long ago, maybe a year ago. And um, I didn't know when I, when I sat down, I didn't know this waitress from Adam, you know. She was a good waitress. We were all sitting, had six of us. And the Lord said, I want you to bless her. <laughs> I said, I'm yours to command, Lord. I said, okay, so we, you know, we ordered and everything and had a really nice time. I said, give me the bill. And they gave me the bill. And, and uh, so, and I paid for the bill. And when she came, I said, there's no tip on that. And I saw her go, I said, but I'd like to bless you. 
because I know if I put the, the tip on the credit card or charge, whatever it is, you have to wait until it goes. I, I didn't know that. I thought they get it immediately, but it doesn't work that way. It has to go through a whatever, you know, that kind of stuff. We've even had people call us and say, are you sure you want to give this amount of tip? You know, uh, they do that now. Well, yeah, you know. I said, but if I give them cash, they have it right away. So I gave her a chunk of cash. She went, are you serious? I said, yes. She starts crying. She said, I, she said I, I'm a medical student. I said, you are? She said, yeah, and I'm working, you know, to pay my way through school. And you just paid for, off for all my tuition. And I said, well, let's just do better than that. She went, are you serious? <laughs> you could see all the other waiters said, oh, I wish I'd have had that table. <laughs> oh, I wish I'd have had that table. So we took care of that. Not bragging about that. So watch it. My birthday was July the 9th. And I don't know how they found out about it. Did you tell them? I don't know how they did. So when we came in, me and Kathy was eating. They all, they came in and they had me a birthday card. And every waiter and every waitress at P.F. Chang signed it. Now that's pretty nice. We can't thank you enough. And man, we go in, uh, sir, you have a 55 minute wait. Me and Kathy walk through that door. And one of them waiters see it, they go, Reverend. <laughs> Watch this, that's, that's biblical. Every man gift make a way for itself. And we just flow with it. Not trying to show off. And then there's been times I've seen some people waiting. I said, how long have you been waiting? Yeah, you can have my table. Oh, are you serious? Yeah, I said, go ahead, that'd be fine. In fact, one time we were in Maui, Hawaii, and I had a beautiful room. And uh, to make, uh, it was sweet, what it was, actually. And we had some friends come with us, and they had a child. So I looked at Kathy, and I said, if you don't mind, they had a regular room. Nothing wrong, any room's nice, you know, at the Grand Walea in Maui, Hawaii. I said, Kathy, if you don't mind, let's give them our suite, and we'll just take their room. And they said, oh, you can't do that. I said, I can do anything that I want with my money. I said, you enjoy this suite. You will enjoy it. And that way you have enough room for your child if she wants to run around a little bit, you know, and things of that nature, instead of just being in one room with two double beds, which is nothing wrong with that. Don't misunderstand me. I said, it's just me and Kathy, that's fine. Well, we did. Well, <laughs> she got pregnant on that trip. <laughs> with a set of twins. Oh. That was a good rum. <laughs> yeah, it was the twins. Was it? Yeah, it was the twins. I just went to dinner with them, Kathy. The twins are now 18 years old. I just went to lunch with them. I said, it was because of me you was born. <laughs> I just went to lunch with them. <laughs> I said, David, that, that's the, I said, would you like another room of mine? No, I, I, no. <laughs> All sufficiency. <laughs> All sufficiency. So I don't expect to be in a financial deficit. When I built Jesse Plans Ministries campus, if you've ever seen it, if you've ever been there, if you like plantation, it's all plantation. It's all white collar, it's Southern, you know what I'm saying? It's all white collar. I had three banks in, a, in uh, New Orleans says, you cannot build this debt free. You're gonna need us. I said, no, no, no. No, no, you don't know the God that I know. I'm gonna build this thing debt free and under budget. I even had the architect saying, you can't do that. You got Italian marble in this place. You got very expensive, you can't. And the, and the uh, contract, he said, I've been doing this 40 years. Uh, Brother Jess, I, I, I don't think. I said, just give me the bill at the end of the month. See, they thought I had all the money, I didn't. I had $1.2 million, which ain't enough to really build, uh, to pay for one slab. And I built it under budget, actually $6 million under budget. Why? Because I watched it. See, I've learned that other people can spend your money quicker than you can. So the Lord, I asked the Lord, and he asked me, woke me up at three o'clock in the morning, he said, I want you to go out to the property. I said, I don't want to go out there, Lord. He said, I said, man, they got grass that high out there, mosquito. We got mosquitoes big as pelicans in Louisiana. And I mean, yeah, we got yeah, mosquitoes, boy. They, 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 see, they see a cage, ooh, that Tabasco sauce. They just suck on you, you know. They just bite you and suck on you, you know. Oh, gosh, stuff. Well, to make a long story short, watch all sufficiency. The Lord said, how would you like for me to pay for this? It was my choice. 
He said, now I can pay this every month, but I'm Jewish. I don't like to do that. <laughs> I don't like to pay interest. I like to make interest. He said, oh, I can knock this thing out. I said, well, since we talking, I thought I had God over a bow. I said, since we talking, why don't we just knock this puppy out? And then he came back with this. Then we will never discuss finances on this whole project again. Now we were built for four solid years, just building project after project. I'm talking about different buildings and things of that. Nature. And I want, and I went and looked at that building fund. I did not. I wanted to look at it. And so uh, Tammy Monahan, he used to be the financial director then. She said, do you want to know what's in there? I said, no. Just when I tell you to cut a check out of it, cut a check out. But, 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 but I said, don't tell, I don't want, I, I said, me and the Lord done had a conversation about it. Okay. <laughs> and I would come and I said, now, I said, Ray, Ray was the contractor, wonderful man. He, I said, uh, give me your bill at the end of the month and I'll pay you. He said, okay. He said, my God, man. He said, I love this. He said, I don't have to try to get the bank. And I said, no, no, I take care of everything. I said, just let me know if something real big is coming up. So when we poured the slab, we did it in three, three phases. When we poured the slab for the church, that's the big, because the TV studio was also a part of the, not part of the church, but a wing of the church. And that kind of slab, you got to be able to get under it. So we'd have to pour a lower slab and a higher slab. And then we would roll underneath that to put all kinds of wires and, you know, to hook up stuff like that, you know. That's expensive, very expensive to do, especially in Louisiana, because you have to drive pilings. You see, so it costs more money for a foundation in Louisiana than it do in Texas. You got to drive pilings, man. I mean, 45 foot pilings. Even if all the dirt washed away, it wouldn't make no difference. That, that piling is holding that slab, see. He said, okay, you know. So, and, uh, so I, built, and I, I came before the Lord. I said, Lord, I need to ask you something. He said, before you ask me, I want to tell you something. He said, if anybody asks you or tells you that you're building something, tell them you're not that I am. And he looked at me and I heard him say it. He said, remember that. So every time somebody comes and says, boy, Reverend, y'all really building something nice. I ain't building nothing. You're not building nothing. No, I said, this is God. God's building this. That's all I said. God's building this. Now, I always try to do as good business as I can. So I said, give me at least three bids on everything. So we'll know, you know, what, when, where, and all that kind of stuff. Well, on the stucco for, for the executive offices, which is a huge, uh, it looks like, well, John Hagee said, it looks like the Pantheon. Because it's columns all around. It's just gorgeous. Anybody ever been there? It, you know, am I telling the truth? I mean, it is, it's beautiful. It, if you like that kind of flavor. So this man, we had, um, I said, give me, uh, give me three on the stucco part of it. I said, get me three bids. Well, they found three bids and this guy that was, uh, was, he was very expensive. I think his was a hundred and well, there was a $128,000 bid for that particular piece of, of, of um, stucco and 132,000 and 140, 41 or 43,000. And so Ray told me, he said, I'm going to tell you something. That guy with that 143, he's good, Jesse. You can't find a line. I mean, you don't even know where he started or where he stopped. That's how perfect that is. He said, but not a guy with the 120, it's a good bid. See, just because it's the cheapest don't mean it's the best. And just because it's the highest don't mean it's the best. So you have to learn to kind of work that thing out. I said, okay. I, I, he said, you want to make a decision? Which one you want? I said, well, Ray, you the contract. What do you think? He said, well, he said, I'd love to have that guy. But he said, he said, the other people ain't going to notice it, Jesse. He said, now I am as a contractor. But I said, okay. The, and I had, I had, I wasn't supposed to go out that day to the work site, but I just had, I had flew in and I went out there and guess what? The man that gave the highest bid drives up in his pickup truck, walks out and he goes, how you doing, Reverend? I said, fine. He said, I'm the man that gave you a bid on, your, on, on this thing here. I said, oh, yes, sir. I said, uh, my contractor said, you're the best stucco man in the state of Louisiana, Mississippi. He said, you're right. <laughs> oh, he didn't blink, son. He said, I'm the best you ever seen, you will ever have. I like a man with confidence in his work, but he's got to have manifestation, not just talk. <laughs> he said, you know, you keep me up at night. I said, how do I do that? He said, my wife likes you. Now, I ain't into this God stuff. But my, I love my wife and she likes you. And if she likes you, you must be a nice person. But I'm not into the God stuff. I said, well, I understand that. I said, tell your wife, thank you for watching. He said, can you buy an earlier time? He said, you come on 1130 at night here. I gotta, I can't, he said, a man like me got to get up early. I said, well, you got to talk to your wife about that. I said, I'm not I ain't changing my time. He said, why? I said, your wife's watching. <laughs> if it ain't broke, don't fix it. Huh? And then he says this, man, are you really building something nice here? I said, I ain't building nothing. 
He said, what? I said, I ain't building it. God's building this. He said, who? I said, God's building this, sir. Are you standing on holy ground? I don't own this. This is God's business. And I saw when the Holy Ghost hit him, he went. <laughs> he said, you know, Reverend, I want to do this building. He said, now I gave you a bid. And <laughs> I think it was 142000 143000 He said, and I, and, I, and I was about ready to answer it. He said, I ain't never done nothing for God in my life. I'll do it for $40,000. <laughs> that was less than the material, way less than the, than the um, uh, labor. And, and it happened like that on everything. I didn't ask him for that. He said, I want to do this. And Ray goes, <laughs> That was on that. Now, when we built the first one, the production and distribution center, watch all sufficiency in all things, being enriched. I used American steel, this is many years ago. So when the trucks came in with the steel, I would say, you, I, I tell one of the truck drivers, you're going back to your office? Yeah, well, bring this check to your office. Now, he couldn't cash it, you know, it's made out to the company. Oh, you serious? I mean, it'd be a $250,000 check. So the president of the company couldn't get over that I'd do that. So in phase two, the steel on phase two was um, 389,000 just for the steel. So I gave the check to the, uh, one of the uh, uh, 18 Willard guys. Well, then when we started building the church and the TV studio, just the steel was $600,000. I mean, you don't even see that part. See what I'm saying? So I'm in the, what I call the uh, con contractor shack. He called it that, you know? And we get a phone call from the president of the steel company. Is the reverend there? And, and Ray said, yes, sir. Put him on the phone. So I put, he put me on the phone. He says, uh, uh, I said, you got me a, um, he sent me an invoice for $600,000. Okay, at the 600, and Ray was about ready to give it to me. He says, are you going to put a $600,000 check in that truck driver's hand? I said, well, well yeah, don't, don't you want your money? Well, yes, sir, we want our money. That's not the issue. But you know, you could mail it. It's 30 days to pay for it. I said, well, I don't doubt you don't need your money right away. He said, well, yeah, we do. I said, no. So I said, uh, in about, about five minutes, I'm going to have my director come over here and she's going to hand me a check for your invoice of $600,000 and I'll give it to your head. Uh, there was 26 18-wheeler trucks. Wow. See what I'm saying? 26 of them. And the head guy, you know, head, the head guy that's leading all that stuff, but he looked like a convoy coming with all that steel. And uh, he says, uh, do you have a fax, Reverend? I said, yeah, and, I, and we want to speak of them. I said, Ray, you got a fax? Yeah, he said, can I have that number? He said, I want to fax you another invoice. Oh, I said, oh, I said, uh, what, 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 do we need it? No, he said, I just want to do something. He said, it ain't going to take long. it take about maybe, I don't know, 35, 40 seconds for a fax. to go to. He faxed the invoice. And as it was coming up, he said, Reverend, I just cut $100,000 off of it. Wait, 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 wait. And I came around and he said, it was 500000 instead of six hundred. He said, I ain't never had nobody pay me like that. You have a nice day, Reverend. <laughs> Ray kind of goes, I've been doing this for 40s. I ain't <laughs> never seen nothing like this <laughs> in my life. And I looked at him, I said, all sufficiency, Ray. All sufficiency in all things. So he said, just tear up the 600,000. So I, I called Tammy. She was walking across with the 600. I said, Tammy, turn around. I said, and destroy that check. Why? I said, the man just cut 100,000. And Tammy loved it. She goes, she was Baptist. I ain't never seen nothing like this. And I'm a Baptist. I'm going back and cut a check for five. Boom, she's running back and cut that check for five. <laughs> you know? and, uh, I, and I have the ability to sign it. My signature on every signature card in that bank. But I didn't sign it. I let her sign it because I signed a check for $17 and they turned it down. <laughs> so I called the bank. I said, I am the CEO. They said, but you never sign a check. I said, well, my signature card is in. Well, we knew it and we matched it, but it can't be him. See, if you even see that it's true, you won't believe it sometimes. But you never sign a check. I said, I don't have to, but I have the power to do so. So now I let other people do that, you know, and, and think, because if I go to sign a check, usually I get Kathy or something real big, because Kathy signed that check, you know, or something like that. And uh, because they'll, they'll go, he, 
He hadn't signed the check in 20 years. But they got the signature card. And I keep telling them, they say, how do you do that? I said, I don't, the Lord does. Because he said, God is able. So, you know, three major banks in New Orleans came up to me and said, Reverend, it is amazing. We just thought for sure you needed us, but it looks like we need you. Now, Jerry Savelle would call that favor. And it is, don't misunderstand me. But what is happening is that's a better testimony to them than me walking up to them and say, would you like to meet Jesus Christ as Lord of your life? They just can't get over that. And the sessions don't affect me. In 2008, when Wall Street went belly bust, y'all remember that? Well, people going crazy, buddy. We grew 30%. I'm the only one at Chase Bank that didn't lose any money. That's what they said. I don't know who would they do. Their financial guru said, you, 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 you didn't lose money, but I did what God told me to do. Because when I have a chunk of money come in, I say, what do you want me to do with this? And then I asked the second question, is this my money? See, he may have given it to me to give it away. He may have given it to me to place it in someone else. He trusts me. And I appreciate that. So I said, Lord, what do you want me to do with this? Uh, one more quick little story. Uh, this is years and years ago. Uh, one of the secretaries came in and said, we have a $15,000 check just coming from the ministry. What account do you want to put this? What do you want to do with this? And, and, it was, and I said, and I, I, have, I was writing some stuff. I said, well, just put it on my desk. I'll let y'all know in a minute. And I said, just, just give me a little time. So I'm, and all of a sudden the phone rings and, and, and it's our reception. She said, Brother Jesse, Brother Copeland's on the line. I said, okay, I'll take it. I said, hey, Brother Copeland, what can I do for you? He said, yes, Mr. Kenneth. I said, hey, Brother Copeland. He said, listen, man, the Lord been praying. The uh, Lord been dealing with me about buying Mike Gober an airplane. I said, okay. He said, you know, and the Lord told me to tell you that the Lord spoke to me and said, God, Jesse will help me. I said, the Lord told you that Jesse would help him? He said, yes. I said, that's good. I said, well, what does the Lord want, Kenna? Since he said I would help him. I thought that's pretty nice that God would say Jesse would help him. That's a pretty nice thing. He said, well, he said, I, 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 we want to give this uh, plain debt free to, Ken, uh, to uh, Matt Goldberg Ministries and things of that nature. Um, and um, the Lord said, you, you'd give $15,000. I said, Kenneth, I'm looking at a $15,000 check. He said, it's mine. <laughs> it's for Mac. I said, it's in the mail. So I hollered, I called. I said, while he's on the phone, he's talking. The girl comes in, I said, FedEx this to KCM. Oh, he can just cut one check out and handle all that kind of stuff and purchase Mac Gober's plane. Now watch this. I went home feeling so good. So I said, Lord, you said I would help you. And he said, yes. And I thought, that's a nice thing to say. He said, yes, it is. And it's not, I don't say it very often. I've had the Lord tell me two times, I've given all my money away twice in my life. The first one was way more money. Woo, that was the easy part. The second one was the tough one. That's when I'd given all, I used to, I made a lot of money in my life and I gave it all away because I thought you had to be poor to be a Christian. So I said, I was raised poor, I'll be poor. I don't, hey, that, that doesn't change who I am, you know. And uh, so I gave it away and boy, they took care of a lot of people and Kathy was glad we didn't. But the second time, then I had the mortgage, I had a mortgage on a house and a finance, a car note and all that kind of stuff. And the Lord said, Jesse, give me all your money. First thing came to my mind was, Silence, just like this. Well, how, how, how I'm going to pay that house note? I could hear that in my mind. How I'm going to pay that car note? And I, when I say all my money, I'm talking piggy bank. I'm talking everything. I'm talking, me and Kathy got zero. Everything we have in a bank, everything we have in a savings account, everything we have anywhere, plus change. Poured it out. I said, I'm yours to command, Lord. He said, you get ready, boy. He said, and he said the same thing to me that he told Abraham when he offered up Isaac. He says, 
Jesse, because thou hast done this and not withheld one dime, one penny, even from the piggy bank, you get ready today. I will release finance to you like you've never seen in your life. I will make what you did as a rocker, nothing compared to what I will do for you as you, my son. I said, I'm yours to command, Lord. And you know, here come the test. We gave it all away. And somebody called and said, hey, y'all want to go out and eat dinner? He didn't have a dime. I said, are you buying? <laughs> and then I, yeah, I said, we're going to eat. Let's go. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. <laughs> they said, why? I said, just gave it all away. You what? Just gave it all away. Are you serious? Yeah. Why is that so hard? Do you believe God will meet you? Ah, that's the key. I'm not telling you to do that. Don't do that because but Jesse said that. That has to be a revelation knowledge to you from God Almighty, not from anybody else. And today, oh, Jesus, compared to what, and I did very well as a rocker, that don't even compare. It's not even in the ballpark. It's barely a snow cone stand <laughs> compared to what the Lord has done for me today. Beyond, and I don't mean that privately, beyond my wildest dreams. And he's still doing it and doing it and doing it and doing it. And we just believe in God. And in 41 years of full-time ministry, I've never laid off one person. Am I right, Fritz? You've been with me 35 years. Not one, none. And I've sent the whole staff to Hawaii twice and their wives. Some of them that had kids. How many of y'all want a job with me? No, no, I'm just <laughs> It was fun. It was great. I'm not bragging on that. I could brag more with that money in my pocket. Yeah. Why? But this I say, he was so sparingly, should reap also sparingly. He was so bountifully, reap also bountifully. So I've done both. I've sold sparingly and I've sold it bountifully. Every man according to his purpose, prayed, perceived, and empowered, so let him give, not grudgingly, nor of necessity. For God loveth the cheerful giver, and God is able to make all grace abound toward you, that you always, having all sufficiency in all things, may abound to every good work. He is dispersed abroad, he is given to the poor, his righteousness remaineth forever. So he which ministers seed to the sower, ministers bread for your food, multiplies your seed sown, increases the fruits of your righteousness, being enriched in all bountifulness, which causes thanksgiving and triumph to God. See, when you understand that, you won't have financial trouble anymore. So don't expect it and don't believe for it. Well, it happens all the time. Why? Because you believe for it. Just because somebody went through something don't mean you have to go through it. Learn from what they went through. You see what I'm saying? Yeah, that doesn't mean the devil's not going to try to hurt you. If you don't pay any attention to him, he walks away. He gets really confused easily. He's the author of confusion. Oh, you can make him mad as a hunter. You disturb him. Just don't pay no attention to him. That is so easy that it's hard. So I, I expect to be blessed all the days of my life. I told Kathy, by the time I'm 33 years old, we will own everything I have. At 33 years old, buddy, I owned everything I had. But I had to put that goal in front of me when I was 18. And people thought I was stupid. And most of the preachers that told me I'd never make it, they all retired and sick. I don't mean that in a, in, a, in a bad way, and I'm still running. And I got to make financial decisions that I never thought I would have to make concerning where, what, and how. So when they want to attack me for something that's a thing, I said, well, they're just attacking me for being biblical. How many of you get my magazine on my, on my bond letter? They, they talked about me raising money for that plane. How, did I ever write you for any money for that aircraft? See, I'm doing something I've never done before. He said, this one will just come. One day you're going to hear me say this. Mark my word. I'm, I want everybody in the world to listen. One day you're going to hear Jesse the planner say this. Ladies and gentlemen, I have an emergency. And if you don't respond today, we are in major trouble. I need to hear from you today. Please. Don't send me no more money. We just got too much. We don't know what to do with everything we got. 
We just got, uh, Jesus, we just got so much, we don't know what's going on. I just need some help. And I, please. That sound crazy, yeah. Sound crazy when I built that ministry debt free. It all sounds crazy because you're dealing with the soulish realm of who you are instead of the spirit of who you are. Do you see what I'm saying? So I just believe that. I've had many opportunities not to believe it. I just don't take any. Mm -mm. I ain't afraid to die because I'm already dead. I, I did that and I got born again. <laughs> I mean, I've been hit by lightning in an airplane and it went purple. My eye, everything I saw was purple. I was thinking Jimmy, Hem Jimmy Hendrix, purple haze. <laughs> I thought, my God, what is this? I mean, everything went purple. And I just walked up to, I said, did we just get hit by lightning? Yeah. I said, oh Lord, Jesus, man. <laughs> but that didn't stop me from flying. I'm not going to let fear come in my life. What if you lost everything you had? What would you do? Start over. See, you can't take what's here. This, all this stuff is just stuff. And I know how to eat escargot, caviar, and I also know how to eat a cheeseburger. And it, I can go to McDonald's and just enjoy myself. Can I tell you one more story? A kid come up to me at five years old. Remember that kid, Kathy, at Burger King? I have a beautiful home. It's pretty big. You've probably seen it. It's all over. Lord Jesus. <laughs> People come and they drive by my house. And it takes a while to drive by it. <laughs> it does. <laughs> and uh, this little boy come up to me at the Burger King. And I never go to Burger King, but I believe God wanted me to go to Burger King. I just stopped. I said, and this little boy, this little black boy, he says, you Jesse Duplantis. I said, yes, I am. Is that your house? I said, yes, it is. He said, that's a big house. I said, yes, it is. He said, I'm going to build a house like that too. His mama said, shut up, boy, and go leave that man alone. You can't do that. And I looked at her. I said, excuse me, ma'am. I don't mean to be rude. You just said something totally wrong. I said, when I was five years old, I was in an eight-foot-wide, 32-foot trailer. Now, everybody at Burger King, listen to me. Eight-foot-wide, 32-foot trailer, watching a movie called Gone with the Wind, sitting on the floor in a black-and-white television. And I saw a scarlet O'Hara go up that stairs. I turned around to my mama. I was five. I said, mama, I'm going to build a house like the movies. She said, shut up, boy. You're sleeping on the floor. You understand? You're nothing but a cajun. You can't do that. And I remember it kind of hurt my feelings, but I didn't say nothing. I said, ma'am, I was five. I looked at him. I said, son, you're going to build one bigger than me. He said, that's right. <laughs> that little five-year-old boy, God gave it to me at five. Yeah. Kathy, not long ago, she came up to me. She says, Jesse, you have done so much for me. You had this beautiful home. Thank you. And thank the Lord for, I just thank you. That's all I can tell y'all. I ain't telling y'all no more. <laughs> it was a great day. I said, Kathy, we built this together. I even told the contractor and the, uh, do whatever that woman tells you to do. Because I don't, if I build a, a dog house, that dog going to get wet. Now, Kathy knows how to do that stuff. My God, man, how she can do all that stuff. And I love it when Jerry and Carolyn come up. Carolyn says, do you mind if I just walk around? I said, no, Carolyn, you do anything you want. And how many times people have come and slept and at three o'clock in the morning, they're walking around my house. <laughs> and there's places you can sit down. I have places outside and, and they look around and go, look at these things. Ooh. Ooh. And I say, y'all need something? Y and we have a food station upstairs. If you're upstairs, you got, you're in the upstairs suites. You know, so you don't have to go down to the kitchen. We got a little food station. Kathy does all that stuff. And I said, just enjoy. I said, me casa, su casa, whatever you want. It don't make no difference. And they just had. And Gloria came one time. She says, I'm, I'm going to stay in the black and white room. I said, that's great, Gloria. She goes, oh, Jesse. Oh, Jesse. Oh, oh, look at this bathtub. Wow. It's one, what do you call it, Kathy, a slipper? Slipper tub. She said, 
Oh, I got to take a bath in that. I said, enjoy yourself. Let me out of here. I said, <laughs> it's a beautiful, be and she just came up. It makes me feel good. Is this real? Oh, it's real. Is this a real? Di yes, it is. Where did you get this? See, that's one side of Justin Plans nobody ever sees. For 30 years, better, I've been collecting artwork, storing it all over the world. But I don't have any more now stored. It's all back now in New Orleans because I knew I was going to do that when I couldn't buy a hot dog. But I had the idea. And I just had to work toward that. So when I went in the ministry, it was exactly the same thing. I said, this is what I'm going to do, and I don't mind working hard. And boy, Brother Copeland stimulated me. Thank God. Whew. Jesse, this is Kenneth. I think I just found your plane. It's 1994. Can you get, the de get here quick? I'll have somebody to pick you up at the airport. We're going to Canada. <laughs> oh, man. Kathy, we're going to Fort Worth. She said, we hadn't even eaten lunch yet. I said, come on, woman. <laughs> it was 12 o'clock. We rushed. That's when you didn't have to go, go through security. We rushed like crazy because they had a flight leaving New Orleans, going to Dallas, DFW at 105. And we made it. Brother Copeland had his people pick me up. And I mean, when I got there, he was in his citation. And man, the engines were on. He said, we're going. I think I've, we found your plane, Jesse. This is it, Jesse. <laughs> well, we flew to Toronto, Canada. Did we have fun, me and Kathy and Kenneth and Gloria, you know, and all this kind of stuff. And I thought, man, we landed and met Mr. Harvey Firestone Jr. of the, of the Firestone Company. It was his plane and he loved it. And, and Kenneth was so kind to us. He brought his mechanics so they could look over. I didn't know nothing about that stuff, you know. So boy, uh, Daryl was his name, Daryl? A really nice man. He said, but, but just this thing is in exceptional shape and ready. And Kenneth looked at me and said, if you don't buy it, I'm going to buy it. I said, you ain't buying my plane. <laughs> and there's a gentleman with a, a little um, cane. And I said, Mr. Firestone, it's mine. You like it, Reverend? I said, yes, I do. I said, I'm Mr. Firestone. He said, well, I don't want the money to the, in this year because there's too much taxes on it. Can you pay me in 95? Now, this is in November of 94. I said, how about January the 6th? He said, you in a hurry? I said, no, I just want the plane, man. I, I, I'm just ready. And he smiled. He said, it's a good plane. I said, yes, it is. And I'm thinking, I'm talking to Harvey Firestone Jr., man. <laughs> Jesus. So he looks at me like this, and I said, can I give you a check, a deposit to hold this? And he does this. Is your word your bond, boy? I said, yes, sir. Give me a hand. He said, look me in the eye. He said, now, that's the way we used to do business when I was young. I can't stand these lawyers that are behind me right now. <laughs> he said, the plane's yours. Well, I said, I said, yes, sir. And he walks like this. And he gets almost to, the, to walk out the hangar. And there was an Eagle, it, this was a Citation Eagle mod. It had a modification that you could carry more fuel on it, which cost $250,000. He stopped, here's the door. He stops right here. He turns around. He said, hey, Reverend, you know, that's an Eagle mod, isn't it? I said, yes, sir. He said, hey, and he's talking to his manager. He said, cut the $250,000 off the price. Give him the Eagle Mod. Is that all right, Reverend? I said, yes, it is. <laughs> Thank you. That was in November. January 6th, we took possession of it, flew it straight to a place to have the interior done. It cost $20,000. That's nothing today. But then it cost $20,000. And it took, I don't know, eight weeks, I guess, to do it all. And the man said, your plane's ready. So I drove over there to pick up my plane so we could fly back, you know. And, and I said, oh, give me a bill. He said, it's already paid for. I said, who paid for it? He said, somebody in England. I said, who? He said, we don't know. They want to remain anonymous. <laughs> I still don't know till today. Wow. Who did that? <laughs> See, God was ahead of me. How could you do that? All sufficiency in all things abounding. So when somebody tries to criticize that, I laugh at that. I said, you have no idea what God has done for me and what he will do 
what he's done, what he's doing, and what he will do. So just let him do it. How many of you are going to be so blessed by next year you'll come back and be able to bring a friend and pay for everything to eat and that hotel? How many of you like to do that? You like to do that? Because next year, the Southwest of Believers Convention is going to be a phenomenal one. It'll be the 40th year. That's a celebration in itself. Think about that, that you would be able to bring a couple of friends and pay their hotel and their room and not hurting at all, just enjoy yourself. And go to Rietta and eat them onion rings so you can throw them like a horseshoe. I mean, they think they're good. Just be a blessing. Think about that. I want to thank each and every one of you for allowing me a portion of your time. I want you to think about this little simple message, all. So when the devil says you can't have that, God says I can have all. You a liar and God is God, so I'm not going to pay any attention to you. And God will honor you. Hello. Thank you, Lord. One more thing. If you're, a co- if you're a college student, and the Lord says, this is the Holy, Holy Ghost speaking. If you're a college student, you've got college debt. If you're willing to believe me, saith the Lord, I will cancel your debt by December. Woo! All you got to do is receive that. Hallelujah. You should, ne- you should never have to start out in debt after you went to school and, you know, and studied and really worked hard. Those things are not easy. I'm telling you, if you believe God, well, how is he going to do it? That's his business, how he's going to do it. But I promise you this, it'll come from a seed you sow and a harvest you'll grow. Thank you, Lord. I'm about ready to say this. He said there will be 387 people that's in this congregation in this afternoon service that will be totally debt free for next year. My God, my God, my God. Hallelujah. I said, Lord, there's more than 387. Why? He said, those are the ones believing me. Those are the ones that are acting on it. Those are the ones that have given and they needed the money they gave expecting to believe, expecting to receive. Listen to me. I'm not telling you something just to make you jump up. God did this for me. If he'll do it for me, he'll do it for you. He don't love me anymore and he loves you. We just believe in obedience. Now the Believers Convention is not over. We got tonight and they got tomorrow. I have to fly out of here in just a few minutes. And I just want to thank each and every one of you. And I'm going to say this, ladies and gentlemen, come September the 29th through October the 2nd, one of the greatest things that's ever going to happen on television. We're going to have a victory thon. Do you hear what I'm saying? And it's going, we're going to be able to help Brother Copeland to go to every available voice. And it's going to happen. And all the broadcasters that are on it are coming. That's never happened to start with. And we are going to give God glory when it's all said and done. I believe that victory will be as big as ABC, CBS, NBC, MSNBC, Fox. You see what it is? It's a beginning. And what did God say in the beginning? You don't want to miss this. Put it on your calendar. September the 29th, October the 2nd. I'm so excited about it. Because this couple, Kenneth and Gloria, has been so gracious and kind. Thank you. The Lord just said, it'll speed up my coming. Oh, man. It'll speed up my coming. Look at that. There it is. It'll speed it up. When the gospel's preached to the world, the end shall come. Brother Colton, 82 years old, most people have done retired, quit, went somewhere. Some, most of them have died. And not him. Not Gloria. Ah, you hear what I'm saying? Maybe we this last generation. Just maybe, Stephen, you're the last man that's going to pastor the church you pastor it. Because up in the sky, it's a bird, it's a plane. No, it's Stephen. Where is he going? (laughs) Think about that, ladies and gentlemen. I pray for that every day. Oh, Jesus, come quickly. 
Not that I'm afraid to die. I mean, I don't worry about that. I just want to go in that rapture. I can't wait to start my work in eternity. I will stand before that throne. I'm yours to command. Give me a job, Jesus. Let's go. There's a universe out there. He might put me over a galaxy. Where are you going to live? New Jerusalem. Why? Huh. Beam me up, Scotty. I'll get there. You won't travel by the speed of light that's too slow. You'll travel by the speed of thought. You'll think and you're there. Thank you. I'm starting to preach again. I can't help myself. It's been an honor and a pleasure. Please be, please be praying for us. Hallelujah. Thank you. Hallelujah. Remember, it's not over. The best is yet to come. 